Hey everyone, welcome to Political Capital, your best source for BC politics news, analysis, great weekly show we have for you. Make sure you're subscribing on all your favorite formats, Apple, Google, Stitcher, Deezer, Cast Pro, Procast, Cast Cast Pro, Procast Squared. All the platforms are available for you to get our feed from, including the video format of the show. You may be watching us right now on Czech News or on YouTube. Thank you so much for being here. We were off for a week, and we got a lot of topics to get through, so I'm going to bring in the panel. We're going to get through that, and then we're going to go straight to a whole whack of news. Remember, stick around. we got extra content for you on the audio podcast. So, panel, thanks for being here. Let's go around. Jillian Oliver, green strategist extraordinaire. Jillian, thanks for being here. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Katie, Maryf- Katie Merrifield, not... <laughs> running for the BC Liberal leadership. Let's just get that out of the way right (laughs) off the bat. Uh, Strategist, Vice President, Wellington Advocacy, BC Liberal Strategist. Hello, Katie. Thank you for having me. And thank you for the clarification. That's Well, you're not running yet. We'll just leave that out there. We'll leave that there, yeah. yeah. McLean Kay, editor of the orca.ca. Hello, McLean. Hello. And you said it with your eyes, but not your words, but I missed you too. (laughs) I missed you guys. That was only a week, but we celebrated Easter. I think we needed a week away from BC politics. Sometimes, you know, it just creeps up on you and you're just overloaded. But now we got to get through it all. And I want to start with the first topic here that we missed last week, but it's turned into a multi-week thing. And we can discuss that. That is Premier John Horgan's blaming of the youths for the rising COVID case counts. He infamously last week said, don't blow this for the rest of us uh, and told the young people to step up and follow the rules so their parents and neighbors don't get sick. He took a lot of flack for it. We thought it was going to go away. It did not go away. Uh, He doubled down on it this week by saying on CFAX radio that uh, do young people have a difficult slog? Sure they do. So did you and I when we were young. So did your parents. That's part of life. So let's go around the table on that. Do the numbers back him up? Was it the right message, right time to deliver the message? What, do we, what does he do now, two weeks later? Um, you know, why don't we start with you, Katie? Sure. So I uh, wrote a piece about this strategy uh, in the Orca last week. And I think what we've seen this week kind of reaffirms um, what my theory was, which that it's he made a strategic calculation. You know, he's still the country's most popular premier. He's got a vote lock on the under 40 crowd and he can he felt that he could politically afford this misstep. Um, whether or not this was a smart calculation, um, you know, I think that's up for debate. I would suggest that the doubling down of his message this week indicates that that he seems to think so. I have to say, like, if I was advising the NDP government and I am waiting for that call any day now, um, I would say. You know, when Andrew Wilkinson made the comments about renting being a wacky time of life about two years ago, um, what that did is that reinforced and cemented um, an existing narrative of elitism and and being out of touch, whether fair or not. With Horgan, like his comments about youth um, were kind of out of step with how he is perceived. Uh, And so I think the decision to double down must be because the assumption is that once COVID is over, that this narrative, this this you know this misstep is just going to be dismissed. Uh, we'll have to see if that's an effective guess, if that's a successful calculation. Uh, but I have to say, in the meantime, I'm I'm really enjoying the memes. <laughs> it was a good column you wrote, talking about you know what happens when your boss makes a mistake and your boss happens to be the premier, and sort yeah. of you know how do you manage how do you manage that telling somebody uh, you know maybe that's not the right thing to say but two weeks later clearly yeah. he believes this clearly the premier mm-hmm. believes this and he's out saying it again and again whether anyone's telling him not to I don't know if the numbers back that up I don't know if it's the the best thing to be doing at this point uh, Jillian what do you what do you make of all this I think it was. I think that it will haunt him. You know, I think that young people have been told from the beginning that, you know, we're not directly affected by COVID um, necessarily, but that we need to, you know, sort of bend over backwards to keep other people safe. But, you know, anytime there's been a crisis that disproportionately affects young people like climate change or affordability, which will be the biggest issues once this is over, um, we've been told it's too difficult or it's too expensive. So I think that young people are going to remember this and hold Horgan to account. Um, And I think we see how kind of the political narrative around COVID is sort of building off of this because it gave people 
an opportunity to sort of say, wait a minute, like, why are we failing? And like, isn't that your job as the government? Um, because it was such a departure from the government's message of we're all in it together, you know? So it kind of, people have been sort of reluctant, I think, to criticize the government because of that that notion that we're all in it together. But this has really flipped the switch in the last week, I think we've all seen. And, you know, more and more people are saying like, what is your actual goal here? What are we doing? Why does it seem like instead of trying to bend the curve like we were at the beginning to keep people healthy and safe, um, why is our focus just keeping businesses and the economy open? There is a hashtag on Twitter that was trending. That's the hashtag new death party, which is a lot of young progressive Ugh. voters talk, talking just about this. And, and um, so I don't think it's going to go away. I think it's going to continue through the rest of the pandemic and, and after. Yeah, especially if, as Katie said, it feeds into a narrative that continues about the premier that gets yeah. resurrected later on in attack ads or other material, depending on the next time he puts his foot in his mouth. Uh, McLean, what do you make? Yeah, to Jillian's point and to Katie's, um, I agree. This kind of feels like the first thing that might kind of stick to John Horgan. He's been remarkably impervious to uh, things, you know, sticking with him. Uh, he's put his foot in his mouth a few times before, all politicians do, but it's never really, you know, been attached to him. This feels a little different. And I was surprised initially, um, not that he said it, but that he didn't apologize the next day or even that same day because he's done this before and it's effective. Now that he's doubled down and, you know, maybe tripled and quadrupled down, it, it's too late. You, you can't apologize now. Yeah. If you're going to apologize, you do it immediately afterwards. Now it's just, yeah, no, I meant to do that. And I'm, I'm calling attention to it. And if you're angry, that means it's working. I mean, I, it's not true. <laughs> but I think at this point, they have no point but to just keep sallying forth. Yeah, it's interesting to watch folks like Justin McElroy from the CBC and his constant charge uh, continuing to prove that the numbers don't necessarily back up the premier's yeah. rhetoric, which is a persistent problem that keeps dragging this back up again as people fact check it in real time. The only person who seems to believe that it does back up the premier's rhetoric is Andrew Weaver, the former Green leader who continues to just run flack for John Horgan, despite what the facts say. But uh, that is a <laughs> that is a separate story. Uh, and then I guess the other issue is maybe the timing was a little bit wrong on this. You, you can make an argument that there are young people who are partying clearly and shouldn't be partying. Probably don't do it on the day that you're announcing restrictions for dining in restaurants that unemploy tens of thousands of young people. That yeah. may have contributed to part of the problem too. But it's fascinating to continue to watch this, you know, two weeks later, continue to be an issue you're right, McLean. Maybe this is the first time it sticks. I don't know, but we'll, we will keep an eye on that. It segues into something that, um, you know, Jillian, you were saying, a feeling in the public that we got to start doing something here rather than kind of waiting for things to get better. The government is maybe off course. The, the Greens have come up with a plan that they put forward this week that includes the issue of travel restrictions being enforced. And we can talk some more, stick around for the audio podcast in, in detail about the green proposal, but just on travel enforcement. If you're not supposed to be traveling for essential reasons, should somebody be checking? And Jillian, why don't you walk us through that, the concept of that issue and why, I mean, a lot of people are talking about it. How should we sort of start to frame it? Yeah, I think, I mean, this, uh, over after the Easter weekend and after the March break, um, Dr. Henry was really clear that non-essential travel is driving transmission, especially of the variants, to different communities. Um, and the province has sort of said, you know, we discourage non-essential travel. They've been very soft on even the language and totally reluctant to enforce it. Horgan gave an interview um, to CBC where he said, what are we going to do, arrest people? But I think that, you know, people are pointing out, including the Greens, that this is sort of a false dichotomy. There's um, lots of places, free democracies, where they have had uh, enforcement. In Australia, they've shut down the interprovincial borders um, and had road checks where they issue tickets. Um, so that's one thing. And I don't think it needs to be like, you know, t completely widespread. Like we've got a road check on every street and people are being fined, like, you know, for going downtown or whatever. Um, I think that just a little bit of enforcement would serve as a deterrent. And that's, that's what the Greens are saying as well. Um, and, you know, other things like BC ferries, people have suggested that you could have to declare that your travel is, is, uh, is essential, just like you do when you go to the, you know, a dentist right now, you have to fill out a form answer all these questions. Um, so I think there's a lot of middle ground that the government could do that they passed the emergency act, which gives them the power to do this. So it is well within their power. I'm not sure why 
they are reluctant. I guess they don't want to take political campaign from the unpopularity of restrictions if they don't have to, um, especially from the business community, it seems. But um, I think that people are going to continue to push for, for this um, because, you know, people are getting antsy. It's getting scary and people are hungry for action. Yeah, a lot of people are talking about it. I guess my question mm -hmm. is, do we understand the essential travel restrictions well enough to have you know, someone enforce them, a BC Ferries worker, an RCMP officer, a community roadblock or whatever, however we're going to do this. Um, it's the message that confuses me, you know, Dr. Mm -hmm. Henry saying you can travel within your health region, but don't go yeah. to Tofino or you can, you know, if you're going to stay, if you're going to travel, stay local, but don't go anywhere. And there's kind of, I just wonder how some junior RCMP officer in a roadblock on West Saanich Road uh, interprets that when I'm driving by to, you know, go mm -hmm. visit my grandmother. Uh, and, you know, like how, how, how much of a discussion is that uh, and how much power are we delegating? I don't know. I, I struggle to walk through that idea, but I know a lot of people are talking about it. Uh, McLean, what do you what do you make of it? Yeah, I, I I think Jillian's right in that there's obviously an appetite uh, for this kind of, for these kind of restrictions, but but like you, I kind of get lost on the logistics. I'm not clear. Everyone says they want road checks and you know restrictions, but like who's going to do it? I mean, if you think about where people are entering the province, think about Highway One, the the highway into Alberta, the main one. There's a little town there called Field, which is maybe a thousand people. I believe it has two RCMP officers there stationed full time. That's who you're asking to man a 24-7 highway checkpoint. I sure you could, I guess, transform or transfer more RCMP officers. The question is then from where and where do you put them and, and how do you support them? At places like the BC ferry terminals. Um, are you asking teenage BC ferry workers to, you know, make a judgment call if if a you know a car loaded with 20 somethings is heading to Salt Spring and they say, well, no, we're we're contractors. We're this is essential business. They might be right. And then what kind of situation are you putting, you know, said 22 year old ferry worker if, if you know, they don't think they're telling the truth? I, who's to say? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so it's just it becomes logistically, it becomes very, very difficult. There's no provincial police force. You can't just redeploy Vancouver police officers to the border. Um, it, and, and in terms of things like, you know, travel between Victoria and Sydney, is that something that we should be looking at? And it gets I don't know. really complicated I... really fast in terms of human power. I won't say manpower and um, and and who you deputize to enforce these things. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you could. Can you travel between Victoria and Nanaimo? Uh, can know. you? Is that essential? I don't. Mm -hmm. I honestly don't know. I sort of get lost, and I attend all the briefings like you guys, and I listen to them all, and I ask questions, and I I don't know the answer to that. Um, Katie, what do you make of it? Yeah, I think this is a dead issue. Um, in terms of interprovincial travel, the premier floated this idea weeks ago. Uh, Dr. Henry shut it down, saying it was impossible because BC has such porous borders. The government then commissioned a legal opinion, which reinforced what Dr. Henry's message was. Uh, in terms of restricting travel within the province, like yeah, I'm not saying anything new here. I don't see how it's feasible from a logistics perspective. You could, the government could shut down BC ferries to restrict uh, travel between the, the mainland and Victoria, but. Like the issue, like the, I think one of the most problematic issues is in the Fraser Health region. So like, how are you going to restrict somebody from traveling from Fraser Health to Vancouver Coastal? Like shut down the port man. Like I, I, I just, I appreciate the spirit and intent. I, I just don't see how it's possible. Yeah. It seems built out of a frustration that, that um, yeah. a general larger frustration in the public that we're not doing enough and that it is time to start trying to, to land some of these Hail Mary passes on some of these big issues. And we're going to pick that up in the audio podcast because the Greens have a number of ideas, uh, including school closures, including a shutdown of all non-essential businesses that are running into, I think that are picking up a lot of steam online, running into some opposition from Dr. Henry and Premier Horgan, who say that's not the direction they want to go. And that and that disconnect between what people think they want and what the government's willing to do is kind of the friction point right now that we can we can get into a little bit later in the podcast. Stick around uh, for that. Uh, another topic I want to get into here, uh, the closure of indoor dining in restaurants, uh, which came in uh, last week, was accompanied very quickly by a call from people of what are we going to do to help restaurants that are going to struggle and, and lose a lot of money because of this. And the government took 10 days delivered an aid package this week uh, called the Circuit Breaker Recovery Benefit Grant. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of different ways to look at it. Is the program enough? Is it is the timing too long? Is it is it um, how come we can't have aid when we announce restrictions? All sorts of things like that. Is it, um, I guess, 
you know, there's lots of different ways to come at it. But Jillian, why don't you start us off? What are your thoughts on both restaurants, you know, having to suffer financially for the greater good of our public health restrictions, and then what we can and can't do to help them out when we put those restrictions in? Well, I think on the restrictions themselves is probably overdue. Like I think the third wave was foreseeable. The numbers have been climbing for some time. And to me, it was like, I haven't eaten inside a restaurant since like, I don't even know when, like many, many months um, because I don't feel like it's safe. But uh, so I think that because it was foreseeable that there's no reason that the government could have, could have had policies and packages like that for hypothetical closure is ready to go um, when they announce these things and you know ideally to give restaurants and businesses a little bit of a heads up so they're not spoiling their entire food order um, when they hear about this at the last minute I think it shows that the government is making decisions quite quickly and in response to public pressure like we went into that weekend with record high case numbers people were freaking out there was no briefings um and then the government came in on monday i think it was and announced mm-hmm. the restrictions so i think you know at this stage in the pandemic we should probably have contingency plans for different levels of shutdown um when we start to see cases climb not just when we decide to pull the trigger yeah and contingency plans for financial aid too i've long argued that yeah. maybe there should just be a pot of money set aside for an emergency response benefit to whatever yeah. sector has to be shut down and whatever employees yeah it's a it's a government's kind of rolling with it as we go katie what do you make of it so i can talk about the the strategy of um announcing restrictions versus aid and and why they can't go together and this is probably going to be the most boring answer that i've ever given <laughs> don't worry we'll edit it out it's fine it's all good yeah. <laughs> so and I've been in the premier's office in Alberta, like through this entire um, this entire year, so I can I can speak to this. But often, an announcement with further restrictions and financial supports are not made in tandem because, honestly, of necessary bureaucratic process. So, any kind of proposed aid that you have for individuals or families or businesses that has to go to cabinet. Once it's approved at cabinet, then it has to go to treasury board. The chief medical health office is a completely separate function from this and proposed changes to restrictions can come very, very quickly uh, as public concerns shift and as health capacity is assessed. Um, Given cabinet and treasury board meet once a week, you wouldn't uh, and you wouldn't hold an important restriction back simply because you want a more comprehensive announcement. That's that's how we end up with this lag time. Uh, the best way to mitigate this is to indicate uh, very forcefully that further support is coming uh, at your announcement where you're announcing further restrictions. But yeah, that's that's my answer. And thank yeah. you for listening to my sleep story. <laughs> no, that's good. I think that's I think it, people need to understand that the public health officer can act in the public health's good quickly, but government is a big full shopping cart that's hard to turn. And it takes yeah. time to release money and figure out a program. And I guess we give Economic Recovery Minister Ravi Kalon credit for doing this in 10 days. The only problem is that he took money away from an existing program, small business for grant program that they can't even spend, repurposed it yeah. into this program. So it's not new money, but it's still fast money. It's not enough for restaurants, I don't think, five, ten grand, but it's yeah, something. Yeah, not enough at all. And it's yeah. sort of like, well, you know, I mean, maybe something is better than nothing, I guess, is the only way to look at that program. Um, well, I'm just yeah, we'll see how successful this is. Their last rollout was pretty deplorable. So yeah, the, the small business grant term. program for sure has has had trouble. Yeah. McLean, what do you make of it? Yeah, I mean, I, Katie, I think laid out the the way it works behind the scenes just expertly. And the, the way I think the public perceives it is there's probably a charitable way of looking at it and an uncharitable way of looking at it. And the charitable way is exactly what Katie said in that you know, uh, decisions from Dr. Bonnie Henry in BC's case uh, can happen quickly and independent of ministers like like Ravi Kalon. And so there's a lag time in between. The uncharitable answer would be that this is the kind of thing that simply doesn't occur to this government. Um, they don't think like employers. Uh, this is a criticism you, you'll hear over and over again. And I think as Katie laid out, the truth is somewhere in the middle in that, yes, they're, they, it is an independent body and they, they can't talk every day and that uh, some of these considerations should not go into uh, public health orders. But at the same time, um, they, they, there's no reason not to think ahead. And, and if uh, we've already had to shut down restaurants more than once, and so setting aside some money in advance as a contingency fund seems like it should have been done months ago, but here we are. Mm-hmm. Okay, let, let's move on to the hot take here. We got a minute and a half, so we're going to go quickly around the table. But uh, look, as the U.S. just completely outpaces us on vaccinations, we are going to get to a point where we're going to have um, vaccination vacation 
destination requests. You want to go to the United States, spend a week or two in a hotel, get your vaccine. The U.S. has tons of vaccine. Come do it faster than maybe you can get it somewhere else. I don't know if we're, A, if we're going to get there. B, are you interested? C, do you think anyone else is going to be interested? Let's go around really quickly. Jillian, what do you think? I mean, well, I think you'd have to be there for like three or four weeks, which would be really expensive. So it's only going to be like very wealthy people that can afford to do this. And I just have to assume that they're probably already doing this. Yeah, they already they already went to the yeah, Yukon. Yeah, they're already and got in their... Palm Springs. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah right. exactly. <laughs> Kate? Um, so yeah, I don't think I don't think I would do this. Yep. Yeah, Katie. <laughs> I'm a big proponent for freedom, so fill your boots if you want to do this, but I'm also an avid rule abider, so I'm going to wait. Yeah. McLean? I will absolutely entertain the possibility, especially if you can go down for a single shot, be there for a couple of days, and, and get ahead three months where you would have been. Why not? At least look at it. Yeah. I mean, the U.S. was saying that they, they have so many AstraZeneca vaccines, they're not even going to use them. Um, they're yeah. going to vaccinate their entire population without the millions of AstraZeneca vaccines. So they've got so much. Maybe they'll try and entice people over. Depends on when we open the borders, allow people to go, uh, what you can and can't do. There's a whole host of things, but it's coming. Uh, and it's a fascinating discussion to have. Uh, stick with us. We got more on the podcast coming up. If you're watching us on Check or on YouTube, thanks so much. We will be back next week. Thank you for watching Political Capital. More episodes of Political Capital are available at checknews.ca slash podcasts or search Political Capital wherever you listen to podcasts.